Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to be talking with Dr. Tector about the future of organ transplantation. Some cool stuff coming through the pipeline. Hey, Joe, how you doing? I'm great. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. You know, thanks for thanks for joining us. I'm glad you were able to make it. Um, I'm going to do a brief introduction about you just while everyone's logging on. Uh, we are very lucky today to be speaking with Dr. Joe Tector, um, who's a friend and a colleague of mine here at the University of Miami. Uh, he's a world-renowned transplant surgeon and director of the Miami Zeno Transplant Institute, founder of Mechana Therapeutics and professor of surgery at the University of Miami. Uh, a little bit of background, Dr. Tector completed his undergraduate degree at Indiana University, his doctorate degree at St. Louis University, uh, general surgery training at McGill University, and transplant fellowship here at the University of Miami. Uh, Dr. Tector has really distinguished himself as an externally independent and NIH-funded surgeon scientist, building a world-recognized xenotransplantation program, first at Indiana, then at Alabama, and now here um, at, at, at Miami, which is amazing. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the Miami Transplant Institute, it's a unique affiliation between Jackson uh, and UM. Over its 50-year history, the MTI has become the largest and most comprehensive transplant center in the United States. Uh, it remains the only center of its kind in Florida that, that really does every kind of solid organ transplant and is consistently breaking new barriers, as we'll hear today, when it comes to multi-organ transplants, paired donations, and xenotransplantation. So, uh, here today with Dr. Tector to discuss the future of organ transplantation. Thanks so much for, thanks so much for you know being on our show today. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Great. So we'll just start with kind of basics for for the lay person. What are the what organs are most commonly transplanted, uh, and what organs are currently able to be transplanted? Sure, that's a great question. So if you think about the really the bulk of, of the work in organ transplantation, it's geared toward the torso. So you have heart transplants for people with end-stage uh, cardiac failure. You've got lung transplants. You've got uh, liver transplants. You've got kidney transplants. That's the most commonly performed transplant operation. And then you've got pancreas transplants. And then you can also replace the intestines, which uh, is something that obviously here at the MTI, that's the largest program in the world. And then, uh, you, you brought up what other organs can be transplanted. So, you know, plastic surgery uh, is kind of the birthplace of organ transplant surgery. And it's only fitting that they're kind of coming back with face transplants are now a possibility for people with, you know, horribly disfigur uh, disfiguring accidents uh, or bad uh, tumors that have to be removed. And then there's, uh, they're starting to get uh, extremity transplants are becoming uh, able to be performed with better and better success. They're not uh, routine yet, but they're, getting more common, and I'm sure people have probably heard about uterus transplants for women that either have had their uterus removed or born without a uterus and want to uh, conceive and have a, a baby of their own. So that's so kind I mean, of... Everyone's, I'm sorry, go on. No, go ahead. So I was going to say that everyone knows that the demand for organs far outstrips what the current supply is, and there's there's people dying every day who just never get to get the organ which they which they need. How does the organ transplant list work? How is priority assigned and, and how do people get selected off that list? That's another good question. And it's, it's interesting. It's something that people put a lot of thought into. And if there was one thing I would say, I, I would, when I was younger and, and now that I've been in the field a long time, was kind of hoping is that more people would really uh, put their focus on how does everybody get transplanted, not because um, one of the things I think is tough in organ transplant is if you look at uh, starvation, people don't try to figure up how to divide a sandwich into 50 different pieces to give everybody a little bit. They try to figure out how to get more food. But so transplant or organ sharing is, is a tough problem. And so there's two kind of guiding principles. One is they want everyone to have equal access. And that's a challenge because not every part of the country or even the world is is as good or, or the same at being able to take people that can be organ donors and translate that into action. But then you also have some constraints because once you take an organ out of someone's body and put it on ice, there's the longer it's on ice, the worse it does. But so generally speaking, organ allocation is local uh, and, and it's moving much more toward national. Uh, but so they, they, they for, for instance, in hearts, they have concentric circles 
And so if you're closer to the heart, you get more uh, points than if your twin brother needed a heart transplant and was very far away. Um, and so there's, there are things uh, like that. For kidneys, they, they factor age in because, you know, younger people tend to live longer with the kidneys and they feel like that's uh, a more, um, you know, you get a, more of a, a higher bang for your buck for, for that organ. Uh, livers go pretty much off of illness and, uh, you know, acuity and based off of, you know, uh, geographics, largely speaking. Um, so sharing starts locally, then it goes regionally, and then it gets national. Uh, kidneys is different in that it's, it starts pretty much nationally, and it's based on, for those, they, they, look at, uh, they look at age, they look at sensitization, or do you have antibodies to other people? They also look a lot at um, what your match is. So what's, what's the likelihood you have a really good match and are going to do well for a long time? And so it's complicated, and, it, and each passing year it gets more complicated. God, it's such a tough decision. And obviously, so many factors, like you said, go into it. It's, it's obviously such an ethical dilemma. Yeah, uh, let's move towards the future. I'm sorry? It's gut-wrenching. Yeah. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, it's got to be difficult no matter how you choose. Yeah. You know, someone is, someone's losing. You know, when someone's winning, someone else is losing at the same time. So obviously, it's a, it's a very ethical um, question, obviously a big dilemma. Talking about the future, since so much research is going into this field so that we can fix that kind of supply demand mismatch let's talk about some of the new novel techniques novel uh, research uh, that's going on what about um, immunosuppression and improved organ tolerance any novel developments when it comes to that topic so there are things there's always things in evolution um, the challenge becomes really until you can transplant everybody it becomes really hard so you, you take organs that maybe aren't ideally matched, and that makes rejection more of a hurdle for, for uh, uh, organs, particularly the kidney. And so, but one of the things that's really kind of neat that's coming out is now they can take your cells, these parts of the body. And so I think um, that's coming. Um, and I think that that, that will uh, add to the quality of life of the people that get transplanted. But really, the overwhelming problem is getting everyone transplanted. Hmm. What, about, what about people have talked about biomechanical devices potentially replacing human organs? Obviously very complicated. It's hard to replicate an organ. But are, are there any advances when it comes to biomechanical devices? Yes, yeah, so there's probably three areas that are really getting decent, but are, are I think if we can have um, an organ supply from whether it's human or animal that works. I, I think it's going to be hard to beat those, but certainly the assist devices in, in cardiac transplantation, those get better and better and smaller and smaller all the time. Um, but again, because the heart pumps so much blood, even the smallest um, alterations in the red cells causes a lot of issues with, you know, the cells breaking and this and getting, you know, thrombotic problems and, you know, patients getting jaundice because they have an increased turnover in red cells. So that's a challenge, but they're really getting, uh, it's unbelievable to see like from the early 1980s to now what they are able to do. I think now they have these devices that are, you know, not much bigger than a school eraser uh, that they can use for children, like in the Berlin Hearts and things like that. So those are pretty neat. Wow. Uh, they're getting good with the, the pulmonary, um, you know, they're getting better. But again, I, if I had, if I could have lungs or I was going to breathe through have this, uh, you know, artificial apparatus, I would rather have lungs. And then dialysis is getting better and better that they're making artificial kidneys. Um, that's, that's really pretty good. Um, so that's as far as the biomechanical approaches, I think those are really the three that are making some progress. Now, what about stem cells? People talk about cloning organs from stem cells. How's that progressing? So uh, stem cell biology has exploded and people are now much more able to uh, take cells from the body, which we call somatic cells, and get them to reprogram so that they're like baby cells that can differentiate or turn into bone and turn into muscle and turn into, uh, you know, and turn into skin and uh, like all the different or organs so they're totipotent or can turn into anything. Some of the challenges with that right now are is directing that so that now you get the cells and they can turn into anything but how do you direct it to become this kind of, of a cell, like a blood vessel lining cell, 
and not cartilage. And so that, but that's getting better all the time. Um, one of the things that this kind of technology is like a real challenge for them, there's two big ones. One is homing. So how do you keep, get the cells to home to the right part of the structure? Like a cell that's going to be a blood vessel lining cell. How do you get it to land there? And then the other one is sticking. How do you get it to stick? So adhesion and, and, and like adhesion molecules to get it. So sometimes they can make these fantastic, like they print organs um, with, with a printer or they can do the grow, try to grow pig organs, I mean, human organs in pigs. But the problem is, is and sometimes it's like the Brady Bunch episode where they broke the vase and they glued it back together. And then once they put the water in, it started to, you know, all the pieces started to pop off again. So they're getting close, but those are going to be the challenges that we're going to have to overcome in the next uh, period of time to be able to say, okay, we can do that. And then the other piece is where do you get those cells? Because if you think about, uh, like if you were going to make a liver, you would need several football fields worth of blood vessel lining cells to get that. And that's a lot of, a, that's a huge cell burden. And so we'll get there, but that, it, it's always, once you fit, solve one problem, there's another problem. And usually it's, it's problems of scale. So that, but they're coming. And I mean, the, the um, advances that people are making, they're breathtaking. And so I think it's, it's a really exciting time for people that are in the field. Now you mentioned something just here, which I find just mind blowing. 3D printing organs. Talk a little bit about that concept. What material are they being made out of? How are you printing these? How are these compatible with humans? It just, to me, it just makes no sense, but obviously it's happening. It's, if you could yeah, it's really, it's really, really fascinating. And so, you know, they, they get the, it's almost like, um, in some regards, it's like building a house where you're almost like an architecture and you have to map out what, you know, where the cells, it's almost, you have cartridges of cells and they put the various cells. It's like an inkjet printer, right? So you want green for this writing it and those can, the green can be the blood vessel lining cells and the red can be, uh, you know, like the connective tissue behind it. And then for instance, if you're going to make the liver, the hepatocytes will be in another cartridge and they'll pop those in. And, and so that's, it's really neat. And when they're done printing it, it looks like the organ. And so that's really very exciting. The challenge becomes, uh, again, keeping those cells so that they stick together under the force of blood. And then some of the bigger structures are hard. For instance, if you're gonna make a kidney or a liver, getting the, the uh, ureter, which drains the urine, or the bile duct, which drains all the bile, getting those, a, a tube that's appropriate for that, that's still a little bit of a challenge. But, they're making rapid progress and it's really uh, very interesting and they can test them in you know small animal models and get really very very exciting results for periods of time but what what are these organs made out of that's the part that kind of gets me so you're 3d printing these organs what is the material that these organs are made of are they made of stem cells? Cells. yeah you put cells in and so that again that's the starting material is always going to be the challenge right so um, you know, when you're in the field and you're saying, okay, you, you don't want to get married to one technology and go down a rabbit hole and say, gosh, I wish, I wish I was a little bit more open-minded. And so when some of these technologies come up, you say, oh gosh, I'm a little bit nervous that I should have been doing this instead of what I'm doing. But the challenge always becomes, okay, you need an enormous number of cells. Where are you going to get those? And so the reality is xenotransplantation, which we'll, I, I think we're going to talk about in a few minutes, um, you know, the use of pig organs, that's a great starting material because you can get an incredible number of cells. Yeah, I mean, so let's get right into kind of your expertise, what you've made your name off of, which is xenotransplantation. For those people who don't know, that's basically taking animal organs and putting into humans. Where do we stand with that currently? Yeah, so it's, it's interesting. We're pretty far along. So I got interested in this uh, when I was... Well, my father was a cardiac surgeon, and so I used to follow him around and see, you know, a lot of the patients that were getting transferred, they were always excited, but on either side of the that patient's room was in two other families, and they always looked sick, and they looked sick because they weren't getting transplanted. And I started paying attention to those people, and I realized, gosh, they all die. And so then in 1984, when baby Faye was transplanted with a baboon heart, uh, she lived 33 weeks, but I said, gosh, that's, that's probably what I want to do. And so when, when I was in McGill, we... As a surgical resident, I was you want to do my PhD work. We 
hooked people up to pig livers long enough to keep them alive to get transplanted. And one of them, she's alive still today. So that's 1994. So lived a really long time. But so that we were talking about getting a few hours of function and things like that. Where we are now is, so we, in our preclinical models, putting pig kidneys into non-human primates, we have about 65% of our recipients survive more than 450 days. Um, and we've had animals go out three years with a pig kidney. And so, if, and if you look at those results and compare them to allograft, so that would be like human to human, but in our case, this would be monkey to monkey transplants. You know, we're within five percentage points of their survival at, at a year. And so we're getting to the point of where it's very realistic that we should be able to try this in, in, a, in a trial to help people um, get transplanted. So it's, that's, that technology is absolutely coming. So let's talk about your, your research, which you just mentioned, basically pig to, pig to monkey. How did you pick those two species, um, you know, um, especially pig? Why would that be your ideal donor? Sure. So that's a great question. Pig, so people initially started using primates. So in the 1960s, they did chimpanzee, baboon, and rhesus kidney transplants. And, and uh, the chimpanzee kidneys, one of them survived nine months on really primitive immunosuppression. She was a school teacher. She went back to work. Uh, and then she got pneumonia and she died. But, but the kidney worked great. So that was exciting. But here's the problem with monkeys. They have one baby at a time. Their gestation is nine months it takes them years and years to reach adult size. And a lot of them don't reach the size that you need in humans. Genetic engineering in them is very difficult. And then clearly uh, there's the, you know, the, they're endangered. They're very high functioning species. So you, you, th there's those issues. Pigs are, you know, we, we eat them for food and we, you know, we use the other products like crazy. There's more than hundred million pigs a year used uh, in, in the food industry. Um, they have large litters. They have a 114-day pregnancy or gestation period, so they have babies every 114 days. They're easy to genetically engineer. They're anatomically similar to people, um, and they grow very quickly. So you can have a heart for an adult male in, in four to six months' time. So that, those are all the factors that really lead into um, making the pig an ideal uh, organ donor. And then the other now, thing that's happening, go ahead. No, sorry, go on. Go ahead. There you go. Well, I was, I was going to say, you know, obviously the big question comes, it's hard enough when it's human to human with all of the, you know, organ um, rejection. How do you do it when it's in between species? How, how do you control for that rejection when you do xenotransplantation? Yes, great question. And so it's, it's interesting. So for about 50, 60 years, people have been interested in using big organs in people. And there has been one problem and one problem only, and that is that you and I and all people have a lot of antibodies that bind to the pig cells. And then when they bind, the complement proteins come along and they drill holes in the cell and then the organ clots off very quickly. So the first way that we're taking care of this rejection is we're, do we're using genetic engineering to cut enzymes that you and I have gotten rid of during our course of evolution. And so these enzymes make sugars that are on the pit surface of a pig cell. They're also on the surface of bacteria so that when you're born and you start eating, your gut colonizes with these bacteria. And so you see those sugars and you make antibodies to them. So that's why we have these antibodies. But so if you cut these enzymes out and they're enzymes that you and I deleted. So we already know that a pig can live just fine because we are mammalian proof that it's okay. So we've cut three sugars. There's a alpha gal is one sugar we got rid of. And that was done. I think people did that in 2002, 2003. And then in 2012, 13, in my lab, we knocked out this uh, n glycolyl neuraminic acid, or it's called new 5 GC. Um, and, and we cut that out with gal. And then the level of antibodies that you and I had against pigs went way down. And then there was another one that our lab, again, we were the ones, first ones to cut it out was the, it's called the SDA antigen. And it's, it's, it's poorly defined, but when you cut it out, 30% of people have no detectable antibody. 70% only have some IgM, which you can freeze off. So we think 70% of people 
if we transplant them with these kidneys, won't have this antibody-mediated rejection. So then we can go to the same principle that we use for human-to-human -human transplants, which is using chemical immunosuppression to prevent your cells from rejecting and uh, in, in forming new antibodies against the, um, against the pigs. So now, are you guys, is that, is that, is that CRISPR technology, which you're using? I'm assuming, is that CRISPR? Sure. So, yes. Yeah, so we started with zinc finger nucleases and then we kind of graduated to talons and, and then we went to, to, uh, CRISPR Cas9. Now the techniques are pretty similar in that they're all, they're what's called nuclease base, um, editing tools so they cut uh, they bind to the nucleus and cut them uh, but it's just much easier to use the CRISPR Cas because you can knock out a number of genes at one time so in the past it would take you the, the way we first did it is you would have to put the cells in in culture and you put a big piece of DNA and basically you went to whatever God you prayed to and, and prayed for some random event and if it didn't happen in two months, start it over. And so it would take you three years to knock out one gene. And then you knock out another gene. So you can see the field isn't very realistic. Whereas now, if you tell me, hey, we want you to knock out 10 genes, in six months, we can have that pig standing on the ground uh, from the day you ask for it. So that makes things very, very different. I mean, it's just amazing technology how you guys can edit those genomes. Uh, obviously, that's kind of groundbreaking. Now, talking about timing, you know, rumor has it that your group is going to be hopefully the first in the world to transplant from pig into human. Uh, what is the realistic timetable on that? That's a great question. And so the thing I would tell you is we are rigidly committed to doing it as soon as we can as correctly as we can and so i think we're in pretty good situation but i certainly would think we're shooting for to be ready sometime in the next you know 14 to 18 months um and wow. I, I think i think that's not unrealistic some things will have to break in our favor for that to happen but i there's nothing totally new that we have to learn to do this um so, and the other big thing that we did that I think other groups haven't done is if you're going to get a transplant from, say, for instance, you needed a kidney transplant and you were going to receive a kidney from me, they would take, draw your blood and make sure that you didn't have any antibodies against my cells. And so if you, if you did, then I wouldn't be a great donor for you. And so the same exists for the pigs. And so one of the things that we've done is we've created all of those reagents and, and figured out the parameters so that we can now go through a, the transplant list and tell you, because the FDA is going to want us to pick people that aren't likely to get transplanted, right? So they don't want us to take somebody who's going to get transplanted soon. Of course. And them. they want us to take someone who isn't going to be able to get transplanted. And so likely... Those people, a lot of those people that hang on the list, they're hard to transplant because they have antibodies to people. And believe it or not, it turns out that a lot of those antibodies cross-react with the pig. So you have to be able to pick those out appropriately. And we have ways to get around that for those people so it's not hopeless. But for the very first trial, being able to pick the right people is going to be incredibly important so that you help them, but also so that the therapy develops and you can help everybody. And so we've spent a lot of time developing all the histocompatibility reagents. And I think that also is, is an incredible leg up for, for our team. I mean, it's just so exciting. I mean, it sounds like, I guess the next question is, if you guys are the first to develop a safe and effective xenotransplantation program, would that effectively um, eliminate the, the, the issue that we're having in terms of organ shortages? Would that eliminate that crisis completely? So you can never predict when you get an entire group of people together and, and, and sort things out how it works. But you certainly would think that if organ supply wasn't the issue, a lot of things would go away. And the other thing that's going to happen that's going to be really exciting is that if you look at uh, 
we'll be able to make progress changing those organs so that they become better and better organs for people very quickly. So one of the things that no one really talks about with genetic engineering is it's two things. One, it's cutting a gene that you want where you want. And two, it's inserting DNA in the exact place that you want. Right now, we went from being ahead in being able to insert genes for like 25, 30 years. Now we're way ahead in being able to cut them. So we've just used genes that are deleted. But once, the, and they're very close to being able to put genes exactly where they want them, well, then we can start taking the parts of the cell that your immune system, your T cells bind to, the MHC, and we can cut those out and stick one of yours in so that when the T cell comes and sees it, it says, oh, this is familiar. I'm not going to attack it. And so then you ought to be able to dial down the amount of immunosuppression you need dramatically. And so you know, that will make things get better and better and better as far as... Um, you know, as far as xenotransplantation goes. So I, I clearly think we'll be able to do something about the shortage. Very significant. I mean, it sounds like, honestly, it sounds like you're on the verge of some type of Nobel Prize because obviously a, a breakthrough like that, which which addresses such a, a large issue in terms of organ shortages is such a monumental breakthrough. So obviously kudos to your team. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about, you founded uh, Makana Therapeutics, which recently yes. just merged with, um, recombinetics. Explain how this merger is going to accelerate xenotransplantation and allow scientists to work more efficiently. Sure, great. That's, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. So, yeah, so we, Makana Therapeutics was a spin out of our, um, of our uh, lab in Indianapolis. And then we got seed funding from Novartis and then we got seed funding from Baxter. And, and so then we merged with um, recombinetics and that's when we got the Baxter investment. So Recombinetics is in the space of engineering livestock. Um, and so they've put as many li uh, in genetically engineered livestock as anyone in the world. And they do interesting things like um, they make uh, livestock that sweat so that they can be transferred to very, very humid areas. And so people can uh, raise them there. And then and that's a, a sustainable food supply. So I mean, it's pretty neat. But so that gave us a workforce and it gave us a lot of places. They have a, a bigger cloning shop than we had. And so now, you know, we're in the, and they've done a lot of things. So they've, they see eye to eye with what we're doing and they have a lot of, um, I think, faith and respect for, for my team, what they're able to do. And so uh, our, our plan moving forward is very cohesive. And so, you know, we've got a, a pretty robust sponsored research agreement that's really accelerated the pace of how we're able to do things. Um, you know, they've secured a clinical grade um, animal facility to raise these pigs so that we can start putting clinical grade pigs on the ground. And, you know, we've got viral testing so that it's very much like when you get a, um, an organ, a, a human organ, when, when the people from UNOS and, call you and they say, hey, we have a donor. The first thing you ask about is, is certain viruses to make sure that the donor isn't going to transmit a disease. And the pigs are no different. And so we've got our list with the FDA, which Makana is, is ramping up uh, all of those kind of, of efforts. Um, and then clearly, as far as figuring out distribution and those things, that's those are things that my group really has you know, uh, expertise in that they're going to bring a lot to. So I think it's going to accelerate things tremendously. We're pretty excited about it. Oh, what a great they're moving down to, they're actually, they're, yeah, they're moving what to Miami. That? So that's Makani is is going to is moving to Miami as we speak. So um, it, that's also going to the uh, closeness is going to make it much easier for us to, you know, really keep accelerate things. It's it's amazing how you brought this hub of xenotransplantation here from Indiana, um, and then you were and then you were down in Alabama. And now here at Miami, it's just wonderful to see how that's grown. So just wrapping up here because I know you're super busy. Let's just say you have a crystal ball. Give us the next 5, 20, 50 years of organ transplantation. What breakthroughs do you see happening and when? So I think if you're asking me, so I'm going to say, I, I think xenotransplantation is certainly going to start popping up for the kidney and the heart, certainly in the next five years. The Germans are really, really far along. And with cardiac xenotransplantation in the University of Maryland, starting to get some really exciting uh, results. Um, people from S. General are doing are doing some interesting things. 
So I think that's going to pick up. Uh, once the kidney gets going again, I'm going to go back to what I'm probably the most informed about, which is liver. Um, and I think we're going to open up a bridging trial shortly after the kidney trial. So keep people alive long enough to get a human transplant and then extend the bridge like they did for hearts. Um, and then once that happens, we'll be able to start saying, okay, what is, why are people's grass failing long-term like they do in allo transplantation? And the difference is we're going to be able to go look in and engineer out the initial problem, right? So for, for uh, kidneys, class two uh, HLA mismatch is a huge deal. So I, I think we're going to be able to start putting in your own class two into these pigs. Um, and so, so that, because that's really seems to be the main driver of long-term survival. The other thing we'll be able to do is, is engineer organs that are resistant to pharmacologic toxicity. For instance, tacrolimus, one of the drugs that causes hypertension. You know, we can make pigs that you can give the pig as much tacrolimus as you can find and their blood pressure doesn't elevate. Um, you know, you can make kidneys that are resistant to hypertension. Um, so, I mean, I think there's going to be a lot of things. Islets, um, you know, there's, there's going to be a lot of different things we're going to be able to do to make them resistant to diabetes. But, you know, we're, this is going to need an influx of people who are in those fields that can tell the people that are cutting the genes, look, this is what you need to cut. This is what you need to insert. But so I think it's, I think for people that are young, it's going to be a really exciting time. When, when do you think we're going to be able to just mass produce organs? Someone has a failing kidney, failing liver, failing lungs. You 3D print an organ, boom, it's in, no problem, shortage is over. Is that 20 years, 50 years, never? So I, I don't know who said this, but, but I, I think about it a lot. If you give the human mind enough time and money, they can figure anything out. And so I think the answer to your question is going to be entirely dependent on the right person showing up. Because if you look at the field of organ transplantation, uh, it looked dead in the water. But really, a lot of people made a lot of contributions. But if you look at Tom Starzl, I mean, he made so many things happen. And so when that person enters the space that they need to be in, things start to move. And so quite frankly, um, more than the time, you want to look out and see all these young kids and say, gosh, who's that person? And so I, I think that's really going to be the limiter is getting the right people in. And so I think the message certainly for the, you know, the people that you train and that I train is that, look, you know, you hear a lot of complaining, but our burden is paperwork, right? But if you went back 30 years or looked at the people that made organ transplant work and said, hey, you're going to be able to cut out genes and engineer genes, but you're going to have to do a lot of paperwork, I'm pretty sure they would have uh, taken that challenge uh, without too much complaining. And so I think we just have to tell people, look, it's not easy, and you got to work a really long time, and sometimes it looks like you know, you, you're in, in the biggest mess of your life at, at an age you didn't expect to be in a mess. But if you just keep your head down and keep working, it get, you'll get there. I mean, it's a great message. Listen, Joe, I know you're super busy. Uh, I'm going to wrap it up. I just want to say kudos right. to your group, everything you've done. Again, it sounds like you're going to be the first in the world to do pig to human transplant. Can't wait to see that. Sounds like there's a Nobel Prize waiting oh, for you. Um, and it's great to watch all you've done. So again, thanks for all you do. Um, we'll be following you. And again, you know, congrats on all your success. Thanks for your thanks time today. Very much. Thanks for having me. All right, Joe. Take, Take care. care.